Hello and welcome to this uh, discussion uh, for my microbiology course on microscopy. This is uh, just an overview of different types of microscopy that's used in microbiology to view microorganisms and then also how we prepare them. This is a two-part series. Uh, part one will be looking at the different types of microscopes and then and a little bit of history of microscopy. And part two then will be looking at uh, ways in which specimens are prepared for a microscope. So let's get started. So a little bit of history here. Um, a simple microscope, first of all, is one that has only one lens. And in the uh, late 1600s and early 1700s, there was a, a Dutch merchant. Um, he made his money by making tapestries and drapery for windows. Um, his name was Antony van Leeuwenhoek. And I talked about him in our first chapter when we talked about microscopes and the invention of the microscopes. Well, Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, his job was as a merchant selling tapestries and making drapes, but his obsession was microscopy. He loved grinding lenses, and he could grind lenses better than anyone in his day easily. I mean, nobody was making lenses as good as Van Leeuwenhoek's lenses, lenses were. So he took single lenses and he ground them into these spherical structures and he polished them and then he inserted them into these microscopes. And they were single lenses that could magnify about 300 times, which at that time in the late 1600s were the best in the world by far. This is a replica of one of his. It was about four inches from top to bottom. Very crude and rudimentary, but it magnified things. And he, be, he was the first person to actually see living microbes. Um, he put a drop of pond water on the tip of the pin, and when he peered in through, into the lens, into that drop of water, he saw a small protozoa um, and also algae as well. He looked at teeth scrapings. He looked at fecal matter. He looked at blood. Uh, just about anything that he could get his hands on, he would put on the tip of that pin and then look at it through the, his microscope. Uh, he made about 300 of those lenses total. I'm sorry, he made nearly 500 of those lenses. Um, and he made close to 300 of the actual microscopes themselves. These it looks like they were made of brass or copper plates with screws on them. Um, but this was his obsession, his hobby, and this was his love. And there's a good video there that my micro students can click on that hyperlink, which will give you a history of the microscope as told to us by Hank Green, a pretty famous YouTuber. Um, the first compound microscope was made and constructed in 1595. So a compound microscope is one that has more than one lens. So the actual the compound microscope was actually made before Leeuwenhoek's simple microscopes. But this compound microscope, which was made by the father and son team of Hans and Zacharias Janssen, they were Dutch as well, could only magnify nine times. So each lens, the two lenses, one at the end, one at one, at one end, and one at the other end, could magnify three times each. So we take the power of the one lens, multiply it by the power of the other lens, and we get 9x. So very low power and it was a very crude microscope but it paved the way of course then you know Leeuwenhoek comes on and he's making his simple microscope years later that had a magnification of 300x and compound microscopes were getting weren't even getting close but eventually compound scopes did surpass the the uh, magnifying power of a single simple microscope so the modern compound microscope looks like the outline of the one you see here on the right. In a compound microscope, the image from the objective is magnified again by the ocular lens, or what we say the lens and the eyepiece, for example. Um, so what is, how do we calculate total magnification? Well, that's what I stated in the previous slide. You take the power of one lens and you multiply it by the power of another lens. Um, in this microscope, you can see here in this sample, they're showing the objective lenses passing through a prism which redirects the image up to the ocular lens and then it gets magnified again. So we take the power of the objective which is inscribed on the, the, the cylinders in which the, the lenses are contained in. That's in the nose piece of the microscope. 
you take that power and you multiply it by the ocular lens or the lens that you actually look through. And nearly all compound microscopes that are used in high schools and colleges, the ocular lens is 10x. And then the objective lenses will be 4x, 10x, 40x, and sometimes if it's a, what's called an immersion microscope, if it has the oil immersion lens, that would be 100x. So you would take each of those numbers of the objective lens, 4, 10, 40, or 100, and multiply it by the power of the ocular lens, which is 10. So it makes the math very simple. So for the four lenses, if you get the total magnification, you get 40x, 100x, 400x, or 1000x magnification. And in order to see bacteria clearly enough to make useful observations, you need an oil immersion lens. You need to magnify them a thousand times in order to see them well enough uh, to make useful observations. Now, there is magnification. Of course, magnification is just enlarging an, Im an image. But there is also another term that's associated with microscopy, and it's called resolution. And resolution is the ability of, of the lenses to distinguish between two points. So, for example, a microscope with a resolving power of 4 nanometers, and I chose that because that's about the average. For a good light microscope, 4 nanometers is a resolving power. Um, it means that it can distinguish between two points that are greater than or equal to 4 nanometers. If the distance between the two points is less than 4 nanometers, then the two points appear as one and they blur together. The better the resolution, the finer the detail, and that's where the cost of, of a lens comes from. So you can buy cheap microscopes that say they magnify 1,200 times. So you got one on sale at, at some big super store uh, for 70 bucks or whatever. Well, it's going to say that it can magnify 1,200 times, and it, and, it, and it can, but its resolution is terrible. So the magnification is useless because when you look through the lens, the 1,200x lens, uh, you see nothing but a blur. So it's it's a useless lens, essentially, because the resolution is terrible. Um, how much do good light microscopes cost? Like, say, ones that you would see in a, in a lab or at a hospital. Um, those are around $3,000, and the resolving power of those microscopes is excellent. Um, and so the resolving power is what's important with, it, with an, uh, the objective lens and the ocular lens. And you can see these two examples side by side um, where confocal's resolution is not as good as the STED. Um, and that's just showing the difference between the two images. They're both the same specimen, but they're just showing the difference between the resolving powers of these two types of microscopes. Visible light, because of its long wavelength, limits light microscopes to 2000x. So we can make light microscope lenses that can magnify greater than 2,000, but if you get beyond 2,000, light itself becomes a limiting factor. So no matter how good your lens is, you can never really get above 2,000x uh, because light becomes a limiting factor. It's, it's, it's not the lens at that point, it's the light, and then there's nothing we can do in order to increase the magnification. With a light microscope, of course, there's way to mag ways to magnify greater than that, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So another term that I want you to know is and be familiar with is the refractive index. It's the light bending ability of a medium. So it's all based on pure distilled water. And that the refractive index of pure distilled water is 1.0. That's just what it's, it's uh, ascribed that, that amount. There's no unit with it, it's just 1.0. So the light may bend in air so much that it misses a small opening to the high magnification lens. Now what's that talking about? Why I'm addressing refractive index is because when you're using the highest powered lens, the one, the, the hundred uh, x objective lens, and which will give you a total of of, of a thousand magnification, that uh, the aperture, the opening to that objective lens is very small. So as you increase magnification, the aperture gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so as a result, the the light has the I guess you could say the opportunity to be refracted and lost. So you have the light coming up through the condenser lenses, which is a part of the microscope that it, it does what its name says. It condenses the light into kind of a cone shape. Um, as you can see in the picture, as it comes up through those lenses, hits the glass slide, and then uh, makes contact with the air. 
Well, all of a sudden now, because the refractive index of glass and the refractive index of air are very different, light bends away from the objective lens. And so the light doesn't actually make it up into, or at least the maximum amount of light, doesn't make it up into the lens opening. And so therefore you won't be able to see your specimen as clearly because there's not as much light being directed up into the, into the lens. So how do we overcome this loss of light? We use immersion oil. And immersion oil is placed between the slide and the lens. And immersion oil has the same refractive index as glass. So we use an oil that has been designed and made to have the same refractive index as glass. So it behaves like liquid glass. And so it directs the maximum amount of light up into the lens and then to your eye. And so then you can see the specimen better. Um, so I just want to mention that. And uh, that, that would be in terms of using oil immersion uh, when you're doing oil immersion microscopy to direct the maximum amount of light up into the lens. Otherwise, it's going to be lost into the air um, because of the different refractive indices of air and glass. So what we use with a light microscope um, is bright field illumination. Now you can also use dark field illumination as well. As you can see the difference in those two pictures there, there's bright field uh, illumination on the, on the left picture and then on the right picture you see dark field. Bright field is a normal mode of viewing. The specimen is seen against a bright background or, or the field. So the background becomes the field of it and it's bright, so it's called bright field illumination. Staining is often necessary because your specimen will be colorless and so the light kind of just will shine right through it and it'll be hard to see and distinguish structures. So using a stain, uh, the stain gets absorbed by the specimen and then it stands out against the, the very light background. With dark field illumination, you put an, you can, there, there is a place where you can slide an opaque disc right above the, the light source. And then it creates this dark field or dark background to your specimen. So either one can be used by a light microscope. The light microscope has to have the slot for the opaque disc to be put into. And then you can see the difference between bright field and dark field. And that's a paramecium, by the way, which is a protozoan. Electron microscopy, remember how I said that with light microscopy, we're limited by our source of illumination, which is light. We're limited to 2000x. Well, in order to overcome that limitation, we use electron microscopy. So the first electron microscope um, was invented by, uh, I think, two German physicists in the 1930s. And they realized that if we use light to serve as as a means of illumination and, and magnification and so forth to to see objects light has a wavelength well they discovered that electrons have a wavelength as well or knew that electrons have wavelengths and they thought well why not use electrons then if they're both traveling in waves what's the difference and so they came up with this great idea to use uh, to utilize electrons to serve as a magnification, uh, a source of, of magnification. It was a great idea and they won the Nobel Prize as a result of it. And so what I have here in this picture is that you have the visible light on the far left which is showing the visible light wavelength between 750 and uh, 390 nanometers. So we're talking about something very small. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So visible light is way up there. Well, if you look at the right side of the diagram, 60 kilovolt electrons, which are typically the ones that are used in transmission electron microscopy, um, their wavelength is way, way less. In other words, they're traveling in waves that are much, much tighter together. And if the particles or, the, or, or whatever it is that, that, that you're looking at travels in very s uh, smaller wavelengths and much smaller wavelengths, you can then get better resolution. So with better resolution, you can then see smaller objects. So for years, the light was the limiting factor. And then these physicists come up with a brilliant idea that we can use electrons with, with way shorter wavelengths to use them as our means of magnification. And with an incredibly small wavelength, you have incredibly good resolution. And now as a result, all the images 
appear clear. You can keep increasing magnification now until eventually you do reach the resolution limit of electron microscopes as well. But that for biological purposes, it's good enough. I mean, we can see organelles very clearly with electron microscopes and down to the subcellular level, down to the organelle level, and even down to macromolecular level as well, like seeing proteins, for example, and, uh, and, and the shapes of them. So electron microscopy opened up a whole new world of, of in, in, invisible stuff, <laughs> smaller than just the cell. So now we were able to peer inside the cell and actually see the structures that make up the cell itself. So there are other types of electron microscopy, but we're going to look at two, transmission and scanning. With transmission electron microscopy, ultra-thin sections of specimens must be used. And as you can see in the kind of cutaway diagram on the left, electron guns are used to shoot a beam of electrons, which are then condensed by these electromagnetic lenses. So rather than using glass lenses in a light microscope, we use electromagnets, which can gather and direct the electrons through the specimen, which is about halfway through the tube of the transmission electron microscope. Focus it a little more with these lenses and then a, flu a fluorescent screen or a photographic plate is at the bottom. The picture on the right shows an actual TEM which is called the Titan uh, which is considered from what I read to be the best TEM uh, that's, that's made. Um, and you can then either use, actually look at it with your eyes through the viewing eyepiece, as you can see in the Titan, or you can manipulate your specimen and look at it through those computer monitors as well. So there is computer technology and software that has been incorporated into these TEMs to enable visualization, take measurements, and so forth uh, to, uh, that, that you couldn't normally take by just looking at it through those, through those eyepiece pieces. Um, the average cost is about $100,000 for a TEM. However, the Titan is a lot more. I'm not sure exactly how much that one costs, but it's more than $100,000. Um, and there's one of these at uh, Penn State University. They have it, uh, at least one that I know of that I saw, in the Millennium Science Complex, which is an incredible facility at uh, Penn State University. Um, it has electron mi microscopes underground in these kind of underground labs um, that are very, very sensitive equipment. Um, but it's an incredible building. Um, and if you live anywhere near PSU and you're interested in science, you can go to the Millennium Science Complex and they actually have PhD students that give tours of the facility. And it's a very, it's a fascinating, cool place. But you can see their TEMs. Uh, they have them down in the, in the basement. You can see people working on them. Uh, a couple of images or micrographs of a TEM. Uh, on the left, it's a picture of uh, the Golgi apparatus or Golgi bodies within a cell, and on the right is a paramecium. The typical um, magnification range is 10,000 to 100,000. However, you, you can go way higher than that with a TEM, but for biological purposes, um, that's about the range that's necessary. That's all you need. The resolution is 2.5 nanometers, so very good resolution. Incredibly small distance, and anything uh, less than that distance, it's going to start to blur. But for biology and biological viewing and purposes, you don't need a resolution really that much better. Great for examining viruses and internal cellular structures, so their magnification is, is great and the, the resolution is amazing scanning electron microscopes now they came later in the 1980s scanning electron microscopy came onto the scene and it uses electrons as well being shot out of an electron gun being focused by electromagnetic lenses um, but as the name implies it scans the surface of a specimen and then you can view the specimen on a screen. The one that I have here is, I think it's a ma manufactured by Hitachi, um, and it costs around a million bucks. These are expensive 
pieces of equipment. Many of them, they're, they're so expensive, of course, many facilities, universities, and labs can't afford to actually buy one, so you can rent these things and pay monthly rental fees. There are plenty of refurbished and remanufactured ones as well that you can buy for a lot less, for like 500000 but still, it's an incredible amount of money. Um, the specimens, I should have said for the TEM as well, for, for both of these, the specimen that you're looking at, um, they can't be living specimens. Uh, and they're, they are sprayed with an ultra-fine, ultra-thin layer of gold. Uh, so the gold becomes aspirated and, and it's sprayed on the specimen. And why is gold used? Gold is an amazing conductor of electrons. It's the best, actually. The resistance of of uh, electron travel through gold is, is almost zero, so there's very little resistance, so the electrons get attracted to the specimen uh, extremely well um, because of, of the gold being there and attracting the electrons, and, and um, that just betters the resolution of of the image so you can see it better but everything is in a vacuum there is that it's totally void of air inside an electron microscope because of course the air molecules would um, move and shift and, and cause the electrons to ricochet all over the place so no living specimens can be used as a result of that so the the magnification levels 100 to 10,000 X not real high magnification power. The resolution is not as good as the TEM, but it gives amazing pictures of surface features. So it scans over the surface and gives a three-dimensional image of them. And it looks pretty incredible. As you can see by the spider on the left, hopefully you don't have arachnophobia. Um, on the right is a relative of the of this spider. Those are mites. Um, they're both eight-legged creatures and they're uh, they're they're related to each other, but you can see the surface, how clear, how distinct, and how fine you can you can see every structure on their surface. So very good for looking at surface features. The last type of microscopy that I want to discuss is called scan probe microscopy. Now this is beyond the realm of biology or microbiology, but I just wanted to cover this one because it's these microscopes. Some of them are the most powerful microscopes on earth we can actually see individual atoms. As you can see in the, the top picture, the one on the top, those are silicon atoms magnified at 20 million times. So this is well beyond the magnification power and the resolution ability of electron microscopes. So what it is, it's a metal probe and it scans the surface of a specimen. This metal probe, imagine it's like a pin, but it's like, it, it's, it's like a pin you have n like no other, really no pin that you've ever seen. The diameter of this metal probe at its tip is the diameter of one carbon atom. That's how, that's how pointy this pin is, which is beyond our understanding and comprehension. But because it's such a, it's such a very small tip to this probe, it can scan the surfaces, look at ridges and depressions of individual atoms. The resolution is, is so small, I don't, I'm not sure if we even have a measurement level, but it's one one hundredth of an atom. Uh, and so what you can do is like in the picture down below, um, you can have fun with this, I guess you could say. This would be an exciting thing to do on a Friday or Saturday night if you're working with your scan probe microscope and you got nothing better to do. Make molecular man. So what this individual did or what these guys did was they took 28 carbon monoxide molecules on a on platinum and they arranged them to look like this little guy they nicknamed him molecular man he's kind of cute so what do they look like well you can have from the simple couple of thousand dollars or even less than that um, you just plug them into a laptop through a USB um, the microscope in the upper picture is that that square box on the left beside the laptop. Um, plug it into your laptop and then you can use that. That's an atomic force microscope there, which is a type of scanning tunneling. To the complex, they don't get incredibly expensive from what I could find, about a hundred thousand. Uh, some scientists make their own. They just do their own home brewed scanning probe microscope and they make it with uh, I don't know, whatever materials are lying around. This one was, the one on the bottom is made by IBM. And uh, it's hard to find the cost for these things. Uh, 
it's because they're there's such a specific use for them. So what would you use these for? Well, they're not really useful in biological applications, so material science, nanotechnology uh, is what these microscopes are being used for. Looking, looking at nanotubes, conduction within nanotubes, and so forth, how to make things smaller and smaller and smaller, like within our cell phones, for example, uh, how to get smaller and smaller chips and have greater and greater processing power. So I just wanted to show you that one because it's the most powerful microscope on Earth, and it's just kind of interesting. Well, that ends part one of this, just looking at the, the little bit of history of the microscope and the different types of microscopy. Part two will be shorter. It's just looking at, a, a, it'll be a short lecture on how we prepare specimens for microscopy. So stay tuned for that one, and thank you for watching.